thank you everyone for joining this meeting. Um, okay, if you can turn on your, your, yeah, your camera so we can see you. Ah, hello, Eva. She's another survivor that I interviewed. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, okay, we also have uh, Johnny, well, he's connecting the audio, okay. We are going to have also Leonor Plafker. She's a daughter of survivor that I interviewed. So, hello to everyone. Uh, yeah, we have here uh, Eddie that he's the uh, he's the son of Gerda, the lady that we are go I, I'm going to interview now. Uh, they had some uh, technical problems, so they had to go out and come in. So uh, they will uh, they will join us in some minutes. Okay. So hello to everyone, and. Uh, and I, I think we will start uh, this interview uh, by Eddie talking um, about his parents, okay? Meanwhile, we, we wait for them because yes, they had uh, some issues, but they're going to be here soon, hopefully. But thank you everyone for joining us. So I think we're going to to start. So just wait me. <laughs> Okay. But thank you everyone for joining in. Um, so, okay, I will ask you first, Evie, as a, a son of survivors, uh, what, like, what do you, do you think about, about them? Like, uh, well, my, tell, tell us about their stories, you know, whatever you want to, to tell us. I think you're muted. Um, no, you're muted. Okay, I will ask you to unmute. Okay. Okay, I couldn't, I was getting a message that I'm not allowed to unmute, but now, now I got this. And I spoke to my parents on the phone and they said that they had been in the waiting room, but you hadn't let them in. So be careful to see if they end up yes. in the waiting. I think we and, accept everyone, but yes, we will check okay. that. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll start. And those are two entirely different questions. I'm not sure which people would probably hear about my experience as the second generation, or I can begin to tell my, my mother's story. Um, anyone have a preference on that? <laughs> okay, maybe, uh, yes, you're right. Maybe we will wait for them to tell their story. So maybe we well, you let, can't let tell me, us. Let me, why don't I start with telling my mother's story? Because she's she often uh, um, uh, skips some, some key details. So I'm going to, to tell. So my mother, who will hopefully be here, very fortunate to have two parents who are still with us, both Holocaust survivors. Uh, my dad, Norbert, is 91. He'll be also on the side uh, with, and he speaks frequently too. And my mother, her name is Gerda. She is going to be 90 fairly soon. Um, they were both born in Germany. My mother was born in a city which has subsequent after the war became part of Poland, but it was a hundred percent German city at the time and it was called Breslau. And that was 1931. Um, her parents, on the other hand, were born in Poland and they had gone to Germany because they thought that Germany would be less anti-Semitic than Poland. And it was very hard for Jews to, to live in, in Poland in the early 1920s. So they had gone there. So although my mother was very modern, modern um, uh, German city, on the other hand, she had grandparents that lived in really a shtetl in which, which for those that don't know that word, a very small Jewish village in Poland. So she also has memories of that. If anyone has any questions later for her about that, about visiting, visiting her grandparents, she would spend the summers with her grandparents. So she really knew the, the really old Jewish life in Eastern Europe, as well as kind of the modern world in Germany growing up because most of the year she'd be she'd be in Germany. Um, so she 
her, she, she was in Breslau and Breslau was, it's, it's helpful to know that it was an extraordinary city for Jewish life. Um, Breslau had the Jewish Theological Seminary was there, which is now in New York. Uh, it, it, it was in Breslau. Um, the first reform synagogue in the world was in Breslau and was enormous and was just uh, maybe a couple hundred yards from where my, my mom lived. And it was totally destroyed on, on Kristallnacht. Um, my, my mother's experience on Kristallnacht is worth asking her about because she was, uh, she has very distinct memories and she saw another synagogue being destroyed, not, not, the, not the main one, but another one. Um, in addition to that, uh, it was also the birthplace of conservative Judaism. It, it, a, a lot had happened in, in Breslau, and that all came to an end on November 9th, 1938, and she remembers it well. There's my father. Okay. I'm, I'm giving some background. Dad, can you speak? Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. yes. Now we're okay, good. good. All right. Yeah. I couldn't get in on the other computer because That's it said right. that you, okay. So good, come here, sit down. Come here. Okay, yeah. so. All right, so here is Gert. Yeah, come sit down. If it starts now, then we know it's her. The audio problem. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Eddie, for that, for that introduction. Okay. Hi. Hello. So, are we on? Yes, the, the audio is not good, but okay. Let's see if we can make it, okay? Okay. Um, okay, uh, we have here Gerda Bikes. He's a Holocaust survivor, and he, he, she's going to tell her story. Sam, there's, there's something about... Well, let's see, while she speaks, it's probably okay. When you're speaking, though, there's a big yes. echo when my mother is there. Yeah, I kept, I, I kept getting the message that the host won't let me in. Okay. Mom? Yes? I was, I was just uh, telling a little bit about what the city of Breslau was like. And um, and I was mentioning that uh, on on Kristallnacht that you had seen the destruction of of the incredible Breslau. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what was the first part of this? I'm sorry. Repeat. The first part I said that I was giving some background about the city of Breslau. Okay. And then I said that you witnessed the beginning of the true disruption of it on November 9th, 1938. And I'm wondering okay. if you could tell people about that. You got to speak a little louder, Eddie. OK. Yes, can, can you, you hear me? me? Yes. You can. Can you tell us okay. about that experience of crystals now? I'm sorry, repeat that, please. Can you tell Crystal. us? Uh, Kristallnacht, can you tell us about it? Yes. Yes, I, I remember it very well. Uh, by that time... Say where you were, let's see. By that time, my father had managed to get to America. That's quite another story. But my mother and I were in Breslau. Uh, Breslau is a large city and third largest city in Germany at the time and had a large Jewish population. And Kristallnacht, I remember walking through the street and seeing a lot of agitation. It wasn't clear yet as we walked, my mother and I what was happening, but it was clear that something was happening. And we walked to my aunt's house. As I said, my father was gone by then. My aunt uh, and my cousin 
lived in another part of town. And we got there, and in the back of that apartment, there was what we called at the time a stiebel, which means a room. And the room was used for prayers. It was a Jewish neighborhood. It was known uh, as the Jewish neighborhood in Breslau. And uh, my first inkling was hearing glass shatter. It was a crowd invading the courtyard and attacking that little synagogue and taking out the Torah scrolls and unfurling them and stumping them with their feet and urinating on, on the Torah scroll. I think those are my most vivid memories of that too. You yes. Mom, you had said something uh, to, to the rowdy teenagers. You yelled down at them, didn't you? Yeah, I, I did. I was with my cousins. We didn't understand what was happening, and we wanted to know what was the excitement about and we yelled down, what is happening? And we got an answer. Somebody yelled out, your Jewish outhouse is burning. Your Jewish outhouse. Yeah. OK, let's see if um, I will. OK, Gerda, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to mute you when I talk. Okay. So you have to unmute you when you talk, okay? Okay, I don't quite know how to do that. Yeah, my mom to... can do that without my dad. Okay, Norbert, what, do you know how to mute and unmute this computer? Unmute it? Yeah. What? Mom, in, in the meantime, uh, can you explain about what your situation was going to school as as a child in Germany in the late 1930s? Yes, but let's take care of the sound. Right now, it's okay, Dad, don't do anything. It's okay. It's okay. It, it is unmuted. Okay. Right, okay. All right, what it was like. Well, the, uh, there was a Jewish, I believe that by the time I started school, at least in Breslau, the public school no, no longer accepted Jewish children. There was, however, a Jewish school maintained by the Jewish community. And uh, that is where I went. And it was, it was very difficult to get to because there were kids waiting on the streets as we arrived and throwing stones at us, but also horse manure. Maybe that requires explanation. This was a big city and what were these horses? Well, at the time they were still used for some deliveries and it was easy enough to find horse manure, which landed squarely on my chest. <laughs> I would say, I know that Ed wants me to mention that, I would say that the school itself was wonderful. It was a Jewish school, and they, their job was to inculcate Jewish pride in these students who had just been abused coming to school and were going to be abused again leaving school. 
But while in school, they taught us to be proud Jews. And it's certainly something that stayed with me. Yeah. Mom, can you, can you tell everyone a little bit about what it was like for your family having to make decisions about where to go? You were trying, right? The family was trying to get out of Germany and yes. the father was successful. Can you, can you explain a little bit about the decisions and what, how difficult that might have been and how you came to the decision, how your family came to the decision that he would go and you did not go, et cetera? Yes. Uh, my father had received what in German was called Ausweisung, which was an order, an official order to be out of Germany by a certain time. Now, as, as you know, uh, nobody wanted these Jews. I mean, it's one thing to say, leave, but where do you go? Uh, my father, as I said, was the immediate target. He had to be out by a certain date. As it happened, fortunately, there was an American consul in Breslau, a consulate, and the consul was on the take. So if you paid him, uh, he would give you a visa. It was a visitor's visa. You were supposed to stay three weeks or a month. I'm not too clear about how long it was valid, but it was a visitor's visa to go to the United States. Now, the consul realized what was happening in Germany. And he said, well, wouldn't, maybe you should take your wife and your daughter with you on this visit. He said, we have a very interesting uh, country and I'm sure they'll enjoy going with you. In other words, he was handing my family away out of Germany. We, well, we, I was a child and I wasn't involved in these decisions, but my parents looked at each other apparently and decided that this was a trap. That if they said, yes, uh, my wife and my daughter will accompany me, then they might have had second thoughts and not have given him a visa. So that was the unspoken but perfectly understood uh, situation before my parents. So they decided that he would go and uh, we'll go some other time to visit this beautiful big country. So my mother and I stayed Again, as I said, for fear that the consul would withhold the visa for my father, he went. The assumption was that we'll follow, but we didn't follow for eight and a half years due to circumstances certainly beyond the control of my parents. Okay, let me. <laughs> a couple of things, which is that, first of all, there's many Spanish speakers here. And after we look at the photos, I will have my mom tell about how her family was, at one point, there were many miracles in the Holocaust for my for my mother's and, and her parents, but, and her mother rather. Her, uh, but at one point they were saved by a Chilean man, by, by a man from Chile, and she'll tell about that. But mom, can you tell about the photo that you're that is on the screen? I, you should see it on the screen now. Yes, uh, it's a photo that I chose to put on my book. I did write a book about those years, those experiences, 
And this was the photograph I chose uh, to put on the cover. It is a picture of a couple, apparently well off, judging by my the, the clothing they wear. My mother is quite elegant and she has one of those fur, little fur wraps. It seems to be summer, but these fur things were very fashionable. And this couple uh, is with their little daughter. And the daughter, for those who know such things, is wearing a Polish national costume. And so for people who recognize this, there's an obvious link with Poland in this family. And indeed, both my parents were born there. And you were mortified that you had to wear that dress in public. Yes. <laughs> but this one too. And this one is a photograph of when we were on vacation, my parents and they took me along, which they didn't always do. Um, and I'm also wearing some kind of uh, jacket reflecting some national identity. Uh, anyway, I think this was the last vacation that my parents took together must have been judging by my age, I would say 1937, maybe. Oh, yes. This is a much older photograph. It's my father and I'm on his lap and I'm probably about a year old at that point. The next woman is my mother's sister who, by the way, did not survive. And then my mother, who apparently was pregnant at the time with my brother, uh, who was born uh, a year after my birth, but did not live. Okay, okay I will try to speak, but maybe far from the computer. So, I'm sorry? So that I'm, I, I'm going to try to speak far away from the computer so the sound isn't bad, you know? Ah. Okay, I think it's better now. Oh, yes, thank you for uh, telling this. I think those photos are so beautiful and uh, like a memory, right? A, a good memory of her childhood. I want to ask like how, um, how does all this war and the education affected your family, you know? Like, how did you survive? Well, you know, that would take hours. Maybe a summary. Say, probably, it, it, it was very boring all this time in the sense that I was a young child. I was with adults. Uh, I did not go to school most of that time. I started out in Germany, went through first grade, started second grade, and then there was no schooling or very chopped up schooling for the following year, five years or so. Um, I'm sorry, I lost your original question. <laughs> well, I had promised people that she would tell the story about the Jilean man. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, we were pretty desperate, my mother and I. Left in Germany, my father was gone. He was safe. And it didn't look as though we were about to get an American visa, which was the big hope. And things were getting worse by day, day by day. And then we heard about a man 
who was a South American Jew living in Chile and apparently a feature of the Chilean passport at that time was that it was a family passport. It was a passport for the person who, who had it, plus in the case, in this case, for the wife and for a little girl about my age. This man had the inspiration of using this passport to try to get some Jewish women and a child out of Germany. And as a South American with a Chilean passport and some money to throw around, he could go anywhere. So we, we heard about this man. My mother made arrangements. It was, the service was not free, I should say, but I don't think he profited from this. I mean, he had enormous expenses. So he could have taken us, excuse me, you want this, Robert? Oh, excuse me for the interruption. He could have taken us pretty much anywhere. Uh, and my father was in America, but he counseled against coming to America. And he had various reasons, but anyway, it was not good advice as it turned out. So we were left in Germany, ever more desperate and really no options at all when suddenly this person, uh, this Chilean Jew showed up. And as I said, he came to help a woman and a child, a girl about his age. Um, in view of my father's uh, thoughts that it wouldn't be good to come to America where he was, we decided to go to Belgium. I didn't, I had nothing to do with the decision. I was seven years old or so. Um, so we went to Belgium where my father had a cousin. His reasoning was that we would stay with a cousin for a few weeks while he arranged for the American passport. Well, two things, two things went wrong. Uh, one of them was that the cousin was not helpful. In fact, refused to take us in. And the other one was that the American bas passport never came, or at least didn't come for another six years or so. So that was a pipe dream uh, that led, had disastrous consequences. Mom, Mom. I, I think these Spanish speakers would be interested to hear when you were using Chilean passports and you didn't know a word of Spanish. And you had to go <laughs> I know to this Spanish. story. <laughs> I know the story you were alluding to. Yeah. You, you didn't do it. You, you substituted your picture for the radio. Yeah, right. I know that. Um, Dad wants me to say that some corrections were made. We had these Chilean passports, but the pictures of his wife and his daughter were removed and ours were substituted. Now, <laughs> my mother. We were traveling, luxury, what can I say? On the train. This, on the train. And inspection comes at the border to inspect visas and look you over and maybe ask to declare goods that you carried or something like that. <laughs> My mother, wanting to play up the role of the rich South American tourists, 
felt she had to talk to me in a foreign language to show she was a foreigner. And so the only language she knew was Polish. So she started to talk to me in Polish. Fortunately, the people who were inspecting didn't know Polish, didn't know Spanish. <laughs> or if they did, they pretended they didn't know. And we got through that one all right. See what happened when you arrived in the train station. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know, did I mention that all our arrangements for receiving us fell apart? You, you mentioned that. Uh, yeah, I mentioned it. Now, what did happen is uh, there was a place that it started to pour and we were standing in the street, not knowing what to do next. And we found sort of a refuge under a railroad tunnel. And someone walked by looking at us intently, which made us very fearful because we thought it was the police and we would be arrested for being there, obviously foreigners. <laughs> uh, it turned out it was a person from the city where my mother was born who remembered her family and who lived in Antwerp for many years and who recognized her because she looked so much like her mother. And he came over to us and asked, are you uh, Blima Lefkovich, which was my mother's name, maiden name. And indeed she was. And he, it's amazing. He took us home to his apartment, which was very small, but he accommodated us. He took us in and we stayed maybe a month, maybe more, I can't say, but it, it was miraculous. I don't know what we would have done if he hadn't shown up. The option of going back to Germany was gone. Okay, I will say no. Um, can you tell us how was it to be a refugee in France? Yes. Uh, ooh, where are we? Here we are. Uh, I started out as a refugee in Belgium. And one of the reasons for going to Belgium, he could have gone somewhere else, uh, it was that my father had family in Belgium. As you already heard, the family had no interest in helping us. So we, we were standing on the street and miraculously found someone who was ready to help. We knew my mother is from Poland. And we stayed with these people for quite a while. Uh, what was the original question? The question was about the French, but maybe you should first tell about your deportation in Antwerp, right? You were in Antwerp and, and all the Jews of Antwerp were deported to, to the coal mine region. Do you want to tell about that, Mom? Yeah, Schwarzberg. Yeah. The Germans arrived shortly after you. Right. Uh, it, <laughs> we didn't really get away from the Germans very long because, as you know, in May 1940, uh, Germany invaded Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, uh, northern France, one, two, three, very fast. They called it a Blitzkrieg meaning a, a storm coming through. Uh, t tell me again what precisely your question was. Uh, how it was? Yeah. Okay. We arrived at the home of these relatives. And they 
wouldn't take us in. They closed the door. Right. <laughs> Incredible. Well, well, uh, we're past that. You're, tell about the deportation to Schwartzburg. Okay. The deportations started soon after the Germans invaded, fairly soon. But they were conducted by the Belgians. Uh, I think very willingly cooperating with the Germans in this case. Uh, people whose papers were questionable, whose permits to stay in Belgium were questionable, such as us, were rounded up and deported to a region called Limburg which was the coal mining region in Belgium. Uh, I should tell you right away that uh, that whole region has undergone a lot of change. There isn't any coal left, and besides, nobody uses um, someone named Sandy has their, yeah, okay. Yeah, there you sorry. Go. Okay. Okay. Go, Mom. Go on. Well, where were we? The coal mining region? Uh, it, it was a very strange deportation, which has never been explained. It seemed to concern only people who had recently arrived in Belgium just before the German occupation and were sent there. When we saw the coal mines, we assumed people would work in the, were sent there to work in the coal mines, but that wasn't the case. We, we were there, we were free to roam around. I think one of the question was that I received in advance is, were there people who were not Jewish who helped you? Yes, certainly in Limburg. Uh, in fact, there were Germans. Limburg is at the border of Germany, and there are a fair number of people who are actually German living there. And they helped us, they helped with food uh, and a measure of in encouragement, even simply by the fact of being open to help. That whole and people were resettled in several villages. That whole deportation, which really is unexplained. One fine day, we get news, we are all going back to Antwerp. And we did. And of course, there was an enormous disruption during those three, four months. Uh, we had lost our apartment, yeah. we had lost whatever we had to leave with it in a hurry, so it, in other words, coming back to Antwerp was not very good either. Mom? Yeah. Uh, Sam had earlier asked me whether, um, whether any non-Jews had helped you. And yes. when you were deported to that coal region, Maybe you want to explain about the Catholic school that that took you in. Um, and yes. actually, Sam, if you let me share right now, I can show a photo of that school. All right. My Go ahead. Of that school. Go ahead. Do you yeah, have it handy? Do you have it handy, Eddie? This one. The, the photo. Well, they invited back. Uh, they invited my mother to come back. And this is her with the current students, most of whom are actually Muslim at this point. And she spoke to the class here. Uh, we went on a trip with, with the class, but here you can see that they um, dedicated a plaque to her. Uh, to 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 my mother, but you might want to explain, Mom, what was yes. the big deal about about you uh, 
uh, going. This is Debbie her in the in her old school school room uh, hallway. But what was the big deal about you being in that school? Maybe you can explain that, Mom. Well, yes. Uh, as I said, this was a very strange uh, deportation of people who were refugees in, in uh, Belgium. The Jews who were Belgian citizens were not included in this. We were deported to Limburg province, which is, as I said, the coal mining uh, province. Uh, and at the insistence of the principal, the children had to go to school. His position was, any child in this jurisdiction has to go to school. Now, this was a wonderful thing for us. Uh, there weren't that many children, but whoever was there, we had something to do other than sit around. And we learned a lot. They had good teachers. The principal was interested. And furthermore, food was a problem. I mean, we were shipped there. We, we didn't know anybody. We had no way to earn money. We, food was a terrible problem, not to mention that food was rationed. As soon as the Germans entered, they requisitioned whatever food they could get. Uh, so he invited us. There were about six Jewish children. And almost every day we ate in his office. Uh, and sometimes he gave us cookies and other things to take home to our family. So this was a very, very special man. Right. And, right. I, and I just wanted to point out the bravery of the uh, superintendent was very brave to say that because the Nazis were not thrilled with the kids going, with the Jewish kids going to school. No, <laughs> that's right. That was not their plan. I'm not sure exactly what their plan was, except the general plan was to dispose of Jews. Uh, but there was no, nothing planned for the children. So he stepped in uh, forcefully in my place, in my uh, region, the children go to school. And, and we did, and it was a very good thing for us, rather than sit around and waste time. Right, and right. I also want to point out for those for those who are not Jewish on this that that at that school they had a catechism contest, and my mother won it, won the cat the Catholic catechism contest in a language which was brand new to her. She didn't even she she was just a few months into speaking that language and to learning that language, and she won the Catholic catechism. Contest yes, uh, apparently, apparently thank the you. Catholic, not interested in Catholic class, but but my mother was yeah. Very well, it, the principal was very nice. He said, "You don't have to participate in this class. You can go in the back of the room. There were I don't know three, four of us, um, and you you can sit in the back and read if you want." Well, this lasted a day or two, and then I was listening. I was sort of interested, and my hands started to go up. They asked questions, and these other kids were sort of shy. I don't know, not very good students, not interested. And I won some kind of contest. Uh, given by the local priest uh, for the person who did uh, very well and very well in uh, religious studies. Yeah. Okay. Sure. okay. Let, me, let me see if the sound is not bad. Well, more or less. Yes. Wow. Well, I think. 
amazing that you were saying right by being in schools and helped by these Chilean men and all this. Uh, can you tell us uh, like what were you as a child? You mean in school or generally? Generally, are you afraid or? Yes, yes. The fear of the adults was reflected in the children, I would say. And life was very unsettled. I went to the school in Antwerp after we arrived there. Uh, but uh, after, okay, we arrived there and about three months later, uh, Belgium was invaded and the whole situation changed. Uh, I, I was afraid and I was afraid I think more than the pe people born in Belgium who had family, who had jobs, who knew what the situation was. I was totally strange and uh, had barely learned the language. I should say about the language, the language is called Flemish. It is a version of Dutch. And it was fairly easy to learn because it's a Germanic language. So I had that advantage that I learned another Germanic language. French was much harder later on. I had to learn French eventually. Okay. So yeah, of course, you were afraid because your parents, they were afraid, right? That my parents were free? Is that yes, what you said? Yes, afraid. Well, my father, as you may remember, was in America. Yes. So he was free. He was not necessarily in touch with us anymore because correspondence between America and the occupied countries was unreliable at best and non existent probably. But we were not free. <laughs> it depends what you mean by free. He was asking you afraid. But, uh, afraid, okay. Yes, I would say so. Yes, we were there afraid. Also, Sam, Sam had want, asked me to ask you about about after the war, how did you decide to, how did you end up in America? You could have gone to Palestine, later became Israel. You could have stayed in France. Um, how did you yes, make that I could decision? Have. And what happened when you got here to, when you reunited with your father and when your mother reunited with your father, what happened? Okay, well, my father was in America all these years, that the worst years, the years of relentless persecution. Eventually, the war ended, and eventually, uh, we received permission to come to America. This took about two years, a year and a half, two years. Uh, and we were reunited with my father. Now, that, that's a very painful thing on a personal level. The stories I tell you about the war, well, that affected all the Jews in one way or another. But this was personal. Uh, I had not seen my father for eight and a half years. Uh, neither had my mother. I think, especially me, I, I had illusions, I guess, about this great American who was my father. And he turned out to be uh, very upset with me. Among the other things that upset him is that I didn't know English. 
No, I would say it didn't take me terribly long to learn English, and probably better than he ever did. Uh, but uh, he was very upset with my mother uh, and with me. Uh, and I was upset with America. I mean, it was not what I expected. And I would have gladly gone back to France, but that was not an option. I don't know if I've answered fully what you expected. Yes. I think that it was a special moment, a special moment for you to reunite with your with your father all these years. I wanted to ask. I read that when you were in France, yes, um, a lady that was sweeping, she saved you and your mother from from the Nazis, you know, or something like that. Where did you read this? I yeah. read... Mom, you know what? Yeah. You know, this is the story in Lyon, in the town hall, right? Lyon, the town the hall? hall. Remember oh, yes! Yeah. No, the no it wasn't the... Okay, it wasn't the town hall. Okay. It was some other office. Yes. A Jew, it was a Jewish office. One of the things that the Germans like to do is establish sort of an official uh, Jewish office and hand over some of the dirty work to the Jews to do. And one of the things they had to do is distribute coupons so you could buy food. Food was scarce for all sorts of reasons, and it was rationed, and you had to get uh, a coupon to buy bread, to buy anything pretty much, although maybe things like fruits and, and some vegetables were readily available, but most things you needed coupons. And we went to this office to pick up these coupons and there was a woman that we had to walk up two or three flights to get to the office and at the entrance a few steps up there was a woman sitting there as though she were resting climbing up a few steps and as we came in she signaled to us not to go further. And it turned out that the Gestapo, I don't know if you know about the Gestapo. The Gestapo was the political police of the German system. And they were the real bad guys. And they were, uh, assigned, I guess, the task of persecuting, doing a good job of persecuting Jews. Well, the Gestapo had taken over that office where the Jewish community uh, handed out these coupons for food. And uh, that day, everybody was arrested, some, I don't know, 60 something people the people who worked there and the people who came to get their uh, coupons. And there is now, when you go to that place, I have been back there, there is a sign affixed to the wall telling about uh, that, that day and uh, how the Jews were removed and never seen again. So there is a plaque to commemorate the event. But we were very fortunate. This woman was, was there. Uh, years later, many, many years later, I found out her name. And that was through something Norbert read, my husband read. Uh, it was in a French publication that we used to get. Uh, a death announcement 
of this person, Germaine Ribière was her name, and it told about her work during the Holocaust. And it described how she was in Lyon, in that office, in that building where the office was, and that she had warned Jews entering the building to leave. So I know who that person is. And at various times, I have been in touch with her niece. She was not married. Uh, but she had a niece to, with whom she was close. And until fairly recently, I was in touch with her on, on occasion. Wow. Um, it's a wonderful uh, story about yeah. how you were saved um, from that deportation. Yes. 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 Right. I think my last question would be. Did you ever go back to your hometown? I had so many hometowns. <laughs> One of the characteristics of this is running. And as a child, you sort of get used to things quickly and you make friends when you can. Um, so I had many hometowns. I did go know. back to Breslau. Right. Hmm? to Breslau. Breslau, I should tell you, is no longer Breslau. It's now called Wrocław, And it's in Poland because the borders changed after World War II at the end of the war. And Russia got a piece of Poland, but the Polands were rewarded. They got a piece of Germany, the region known as Silesia. And Breslau was the capital of Silesia. So I have been back. Uh, I imagine it's quite, pla I think Eddie, you were there more recently than I, I was. I, 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 if I can make one, if I can my dream, I think it's amazing, which is that my mother's synagogue which is behind my parents in this photo which had been destroyed on crystal knock and had sat right. as a as a gaping hole with the with the roof collapsed in and and a burned out shell was reopened in 2010 and we were lucky enough to be there just by by luck we found out a few days beforehand that they were reopening it and we were lucky enough to be there here's a picture of us inside um inside the the, the synagogue that was rebuilt and outside here you can see people waiting to come in this was a huge event in poland um lots of dignitaries were there so um and my mother was one of three survivors that were that were there. Uh, yeah. So so uh, I I have a couple pictures also, Mom, from the cemetery. But before we do that, did you want to say anything about the reopening of the synagogue? Of white, it's called the White White Stork, Stork Synagogue. Yeah, uh, you know, it was a, a, a very large synagogue, and now it is used mostly by the city for large events. There are not enough Jews left in Wrocław, as it's now called, to maintain a synagogue or to need a synagogue of that size. So it has various uh, uses outside of its religious one. But I went to school in that court. There's a big courtyard, as you remember. I went to the Jewish school there. Right here on the right side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was a wonderful school. I mean, I was there uh, a little more than a year. I did first grade there, and I started second grade. And these teachers were incredible. 
they really made us work. They had a sense, an urgency to impart some knowledge in us because they suspected, and they were right, that uh, we wouldn't have much schooling. But how about the mayor showing up? Yeah. yeah, right. That, yes, uh, one of the things that happened at this reunion uh, of the dedic rededication of, of my synagogue was uh, that the mayor showed up. Actually, he didn't show up. He sent a delegate. He was sick. Well, he was in a plane crash. That was talking about the president of the mayor. Yeah, that's a, uh, okay. The mayor, okay. The mayor was there and he asked, he begged us to come back and live in Wrocław. I don't know how many people took took him up on that. I'm sure if they did, they would have been well treated, but I must say I was not tempted. So let me also, um, I have a video that I've, I'm going to see if I can show this by sharing my screen. And I'm first going to set it up quickly that my mother had a brother who died before his second birthday. And on, on Sundays, they would go out, my mother and her mother would go to the grave and bring a picnic. They would take the, the tram, the, 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 sub, the streetcar. And trolley. Go, trolley and, and go out there and bring a picnic. And my mother, my grandmother would, would talk to her son who, who, had, who had died. It was very, very painful um, for her and Anyway, so then when we went back for the synagogue reopening, we tried to visit the grave. Um, yes. and, and we had to go into the cemetery, which had not been maintained, except for a tiny little portion at the very entrance, where the, where the, which was still active for, for current members of the community. This was a vast, vast cemetery, most of which was maintained. And I'm going to try to show you that in one second here, what it was like for us um, going through, let's see. If oh, yeah, yeah, totally abandoned. Yeah, totally let's see abandoned. if the video is going to start. There might be too much bandwidth with, a, with us on. But um, you can see that the graves, even in the still shot, you can see that the graves were, were kind of just taken up by the forest. Uh, yeah, it was sinking. Yeah. I'm gonna give yeah. it one, one second more because it's great if it worked, but uh, well, okay, here you can see it's, it's moving. This was forest and you would see kind of in, in amongst this forest, there are these gravestones. Nobody was maintaining it for all that time. Anyway, the amazing thing is, hang on one second. The amazing thing is that we eventually found it, that, that there were so many gravestones that you would never be able to identify that were totally covered. And somehow the gravestone of my mother's brother was there and and you can see um, yeah. uh, George, George Berezonsky. Berezonsky. Yeah. That was, that was, Berezonsky. George right. Berezonsky. Yeah. Right. Right. And yeah, that was utterly amazing. Right. I wow. also point out while we're here, I had mentioned this that this was the birthplace of Reform Judaism, and that was actually just down the street from my mother's uh, house at synagogue, and it was destroyed on Kristallnacht. And this is the, uh, the the memorial that that's there to to commemorate. That's them. in Breslau. Yes. In, 
Brooksflow in, in what's now called Brookswoof. Yeah, Brooksoft building. Yeah. And this is actually the, these kids are playing. This playground is on the site where the synagogue used to be. But it's these these kids are, are there. This is where Breslau now looks like downtown. Um but but maybe maybe one last thing, one last story that my mother has not told is is this structure on the right hand side is currently a prison and was a prison then. Yes. And my mother's apartment was, you see these apartments on the left side of the street? Those are yes. those are new. Those were born were built after the war. But there were other apartments that were there, and my mother's apartment was on one of the higher floors so that they could see down into that jail right across the street. So, Mom, do you want to, to explain the significance of that? That had a big significance yeah. to people yeah. in the community. Do you yeah. want to explain? Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, we could see, as Eddie explained, uh, the prisoners when they marched, I believe there are some international conventions about how to treat prisoners. And they require that from time to time they go outside and get some fresh air. Anyway, that is what was happening, that at a certain predictable time, these prisoners came out and marched around for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Now, this became known uh, to the larger Jewish community that was still there in 1938. Mm -hmm. And that we had, a, from our window, we had a good view of that. So as it became known, we found that people knocking on our door, coming in with, uh, what do you call these glasses? Binoculars. Binoculars. <laughs> coming in with binoculars, crowding around the window, trying to identify the prisoners marching in the prison yard. Now, why, why would they be so desperate to identify them uh, because people were disappearing. They, they, they went out to buy something and they were gone. They didn't come back. And the place to, the logical place to look for them was in the prison. So every day our apartment was full of people we didn't know looking out the window and hoping to locate uh, a missing relative, uh, and quite often they did actually. It was not rare for them to be able to see some sign of a missing person. Now, I remember one in particular um, who had received a visa, something that people were dying to get, a visa out of there. And what he was doing, full of illusion, <laughs> was holding up the passport with the visa for his brother to see across the street in the prison. That struck me as an impossible task, and I'm sure that he never did see it. But the good news is somebody had a passport to get out of there, had a visa. You don't mean a passport, you don't mean a visa, you mean release, release. Papers. release documents. Release documents. From the jail. They release papers. No, they no, those, no, 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 those were passports with visas. But of course, whatever they were, they, they couldn't see them. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> it's too much to expect. Right. It was too too big a distance. But it was always at a certain time crowded with people, hoping to catch sight. Yeah. 
happens though. Mm -hmm. Someone who disappeared. Yes, and eventually yes. many of these people were released and, and reunited with their family, <laughs> probably only to be caught later at a later time. But, Yes, I think it was so interesting, all the things that you told us, and yeah, thank God you are alive, you went to America, and you are here with us, so I think we are going to make some questions of the people that it's still here, but before that, I would like to take a picture of all of us, of this sure. meeting. So if you can turn on your camera, please do it. If I can what? No, you know the, the people. If people your can camera. turn on your camera, it will be nice oh, okay. because I will take a photo. Uh, some people had to went out the meeting, but we are 23 right now. Actually, for you to know, you have two young Polish uh, people here. Magdalena, How many? Bartuome, they are from Finland. They are hearing you. Oh, okay. I'm glad to. I'm glad they're there. <laughs> okay, so turn on your camera if you can. Everyone. No, but, no, no not you. How, how do I take the camera? No, no it's you. Okay. Not you. I need to you. turn on the camera, and I don't know what that means. No, you're okay, Gerda. What? You're We're okay. People. We're asking oh, other people. We're asking other people. Don't look nice so, for the picture, Gerda. Okay, well. You understand. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. No, <laughs> just smile. <laughs> just smile. Okay. okay. I can do that. I think... Uh, I'm going to take the picture. Maybe the other uh, people, they can't turn on, so don't worry. I will take the picture, one, two. Okay. Okay, thank you. So now we have a question here from, from Alejandra. Eddie, can you read it? Because my yes. sound Mom. Um. Alejandra wants to know, can you think of a good memory during that time, from that time? The time being from the time of my birth to after the war, kind of. So, during, the worst, during the worst times, was there anything good? Can you, do you have any good memory during, during those times? E, e, yes, um, sure. When I arrived in Belgium in 1939, and I was eight years old, I went to school. I went to a Jewish school. And it, it was a very, very nice school. And I, my good memories are that I did very well. I was generally a good student, but here I was in the new language. but. I was very proud of my report cards. That's one good memory. I'm also, okay, I'll, I'll report on the one, I'll give you one that I'm not all that proud of. And that is the city of Lyon, which was hell on earth. Um, everybody was starving. I was walking on the street and there was, a young man ahead of me, two steps ahead. And he had a treasure. He had a loaf of bread, you know, a flute, one of these long, thin mm -hmm. breads. And he was carrying it uh, under his arm, okay? Carrying under his arm. And he was walking and it slipped out from his hold. I was walking behind him. We had no food. Food, food was a terrible problem. I ran 
and grab that bread, that loaf of bread. And I knew he would come looking for it. So I went to hide in a building behind the staircase. And sure enough, he peeked in but didn't see me. I was well hidden. And I had that loaf of bread. I took it home, home such as it was. And we had a feast. And we had bread. My mother was, couldn't praise me enough for the theft of the spring. <laughs> I, I tell this with a certain amount of uh, embarrassment and certainly chagrin that I didn't run after him and give him his bread. But circumstances were such. Right. Right. Let's Okay. Any, any other questions that I see here, you would, I, um, mom, how do we, how do we, um, how do we ensure that it never happens again? Everybody says never again. Yes. Yeah. What do do you mean? Well, I tell you what, there's no universal answer, but I think I have a very good answer to this, as far as Jews are concerned. And the answer is Israel. Had there been an Israel, this would not have happened. And it certainly would not have happened to the level it did. I mean, it wouldn't have been the universal uh, answer, but it would have made an enormous difference. Uh, the British, who were the administrators of the League of Nations, chose them to administer what became ultimately Israel, Palestine. They made sure that no Jews could reach the place. It was very difficult to get there. Had we been there, it would have been okay. But that option was basically closed. So, what I can say, never again, there is Israel. Thank you. The, well, the last question I have is, what would you say to my generation about valuing what we have? and not hate, would you say, to my young generation? Okay. Well, I think there is an assumption that people who have suffered somehow have wisdom. I, I don't think I have much wisdom to impart. Nor can I, I, I can offer platitudes like, you know, never see anything untoward because you should react to everything. I think there's a certain amount of self-preservation that's probably healthy in the history of humankind. And selfish, though it might be, it is a good thing to have that. I think in general, I am, I don't have universal answers to your question. It's a very good one. I must say I've thought about it myself very often. But the thing is to really, whatever your stand is going to be, do it early. If in 1935, 36, there had been a response uh, from Germans who were socialists or communists, certainly opposed to the regime, if there had been a response other than running to America or, or going somewhere else, uh, it, it would have made a difference, yes. Uh, as it was, he was Hitler and his minions uh, was left to do 
whatever he please. Okay. Well, look, okay. I, I, I want to thank you for being so interested. Of course. I want to ask um, if uh, you're that, you're you know, we have here another um, two survivors. We have a uh, John, well, in Sweden, he's Lenovo, but no. And Eva. I don't know if Johnny or Eva can say something. That what? I'm sorry, I missed something. Uh, you have an Arab? I, I'm Is going to mute right? you for a second. So, okay, Johnny, come on. Ah, yeah. Okay. I was listening to the story of Mrs. B. Callas and how different is your story to mine. You, I don't know if you can realize how lucky you were. Yes, I mean, I'm alive. Yeah, you're alive and yes. I'm alive, except I spent four years in concentration camps. Wow. I, I survived Auschwitz, I survived I lost my whole family. And I'm really glad to hear the way you're talking, the way you spend your war. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Baker. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm glad to see you <laughs> electronically. And uh, I, what can I say? This is my story is like child's play yeah. Yeah. compared to someone who survived in Auschwitz. Yeah. And knowing the that. misery that I went through, I can't begin to to express my my feelings about what your suffering was. It should never happen again. Never. Exactly. Never. Yeah. And it Eva, with Eva. Israel. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Eva, do you want to say something? Well, I want to thank you, especially the young people. Mom, Eva, for... Eva is speak. What? Eva, the other Holocaust survivors. Oh, yeah, I can... Oh, I... I'm sorry, yeah, okay. I... I have the same feeling as Gerda when it comes to meeting actual survivors of the concentration camps, uh, because what they've gone through was, there are no words to express it. And yes. every time I go to Auschwitz, I think the same thing, that if I had been there as a child, I don't think I could have survived. Right, right. Gerda, yours is a beautiful story. Thank you so much for telling it. And well, you're a beautiful lady. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much. You're very kind. By the way, I have written my story. I think we should all try to do that. But this one has been published, and it's called Through the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And that's kind of I think most of you know the psalm, which goes, let's see. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Yeah, it's miraculous. It was someone looking after us. Yes. Yeah. Well, oh. Sam, where are you located? I understand in Mexico? Yes, I'm yes. in Mexico, in a city in called Cuernavaca. And I've been doing these interviews. But yes, thank you so much for telling the story. Here, all of you can watch the, the book. Uh, Gerda's book and we also put the link of Amazon in the chat if you want to buy it but yes before uh, ending this meeting I will read you a poem I will read you okay 
Sounds lovely I'm already. Not, it's not a problem. Okay. okay. It says, mm -hmm. he remembers as it as it, it was yesterday, sorry. Hiding, watching everything was great, but she was saved by the unknown. And today she has a life full of colors, standing with honor. Thank you so well, much. Thank you, Samantha, for doing that for your interest for caring, much appreciated. And I know you will remember and tell your children. Of course. So thank everyone for being there in, in this meeting. I also want to thank uh, Isaac from Diario Colombia, from Mexico, because this meeting, it's being streamed on Facebook in, um, the voice of the silence and in Diario Judío, so many people can know your story and young people too, you know. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. So it's time to say goodbye, but thank you. So if you can turn on your camera, uh, not you, Gerda, everyone, and say goodbye and thank you to Gerda, maybe your microphone, <laughs> and say thank you. Goodbye, Gerda. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so Stay much. Stay well. Stay well. Happy Thanksgiving. And I just put my uh, email address into the chat for everyone. If anyone wants to contact me, has any follow up questions. Eddie, put it again just now. Put again your mother. Eddie. All right. Thank you. We have it here. Then contact me. Yes. Thank you so much. Bye bye. You can write bye. to Eddie there. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Be a dream.